Hey everyone, welcome back to Wicked Deeds. We're your hosts, I'm Brittany. And I'm John. And before we dive into today's case, we just have some news to share. As of March 14th, 2023, Wicked Deeds will have released 76 episodes. Your support has made the thousands of collective hours we've spent researching, recording, and producing content for this show feel as though it's been time well spent. But we think we can do better. To help us kick things into high gear, we're going to begin running ads in our episodes starting next week, March 21st, 2023. As a brief disclaimer, these ads will be automatically generated for the time being and are not specifically selected by us. Although we've elected to opt out of many potentially controversial ad topics, we ask that you bear with us in the event that something distasteful makes its way through. For those of you who are looking for a different way to help support the show, starting today, you can help support Wicked Deeds through Patreon, where we're offering an ad-free listening experience, access to our patron-only Discord server to chat with us, and the option to take part in polls regarding future content. We've got some cool stuff coming down the pike, and it's all made possible by each and every one of you. With that being said, let's get back to what you're all here for. Today, we'll be discussing the case of a 10-year-old girl who was riding her bike around her neighborhood as she often did, but never came home. After several days of searching, her body was found and the hunt for her killer ensued. A suspect was named after a very short time, but the details of the case just never seemed to match up to that suspect being involved. It's been 33 years now, and justice has yet to be served. Today's episode is about the murder of Rosie Gordon. On Sunday, July 2nd, 1989, 10-year-old Rhiannon Gordon, who went by Rosie, was spending the afternoon with one of her best friends, Amy, who lived only a few blocks from Rosie and her family. The Gordons lived on Holland's Lane, which was within the Lake Braddock Community Association in Burke, Virginia, located in Fairfax County. Rosie lived with her parents, David and Leanne, as well as her 15-year-old brother, Wayne. Now, that Sunday, just before the 4th of July, was the perfect summer day, and the two soon-to-be fifth graders were spending their afternoon playing outside together. One of Rosie's favorite things to do was ride her pink bike throughout the neighborhood, so at some point while the two were playing, they took a quick walk back to Rosie's house to pick up her bike so they could ride around together for the rest of their afternoon playdate. Now, Rosie was a very responsible 10-year-old and knew she had to be home on time for her 7 p.m. curfew. So at about 6.55 p.m., Amy walked with Rosie to the corner of Lake Braddock Road, which was only about two blocks from Rosie's house, and the two said goodbye. Amy then turned around to head back to her place, and Rosie was going to make the quick two-block bike ride to her house on Holland's Lane. Meanwhile, Rosie's parents were waiting at home, expecting their daughter to walk through the door at any minute because she did have a curfew to abide by, and it appeared as though she was always home on time. However, time continued to pass and Rosie didn't show up, which was completely unlike her. And after a short while, her parents started to panic and they began searching for her. And when they couldn't locate her by around 8 p.m., they contacted police and reported her missing. Once Rosie was officially reported missing, authorities and the Lake Braddock community sprang into action, with an extensive search of the area taking place that Sunday night and during the following several days. But before we touch on the searches, I do just want to say that there was some talk about authorities potentially initially believing that Rosie could have been a runaway, but it seemed as though that idea was shot down pretty quickly after investigators received more information that led them to believe otherwise. Also, based on statements from her parents, there would have been no reason for Rosie to want to run away. They said that they'd had a really fun weekend together, she was in good spirits, in a great mood, and wasn't in any sort of trouble at home, so her running away just didn't make sense. Now, in terms of the searches that took place for a number of days after Rosie didn't return home, police, neighbors, friends, and family all became involved. Police and volunteers walked shoulder to shoulder, scouring a roughly two-mile radius from where Rosie had been last seen. A boat and dive team were used to search Lake Braddock, which was within this community they lived in and only slightly to the east of Holland's Lane, where the Gordon family lived. 
And authorities were also using scent dogs, helicopters, and on top of the foot searches that were being conducted, they'd even canvassed upwards of 1,300 homes that were in this neighborhood. The residents of the Lake Braddock community banded together to support the Gordon family, and they even put out information about Rosie's case over local radio stations. And there were even reports about a local Domino's pizza location that sent out a flyer about Rosie with every delivery they had. And not only that, friends and neighbors also took the time to hand out flyers to every house in the vicinity that was having a 4th of July party. That's a good idea that you don't really think about that often, is sending out flyers with, like, delivery food. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, we know about the milk cartons. Mm -hmm. But when people are ordering takeout, if you just plaster these flyers to all these takeout places and Mm -hmm. just say, hey, do you mind throwing these with the takeout orders that you deliver? I liked to see that. That was something different, and you can tell that everyone really did band together. They rallied around the family, Mm -hmm. and they were just helping in any way they could. Now, as the searches continued, David, Rosie's father, actually ended up locating his daughter's pink bicycle, the one she'd gone back to her house with Amy to get on that Sunday. He located the bike at the corner of Lake Braddock Road, the same spot where Rosie and Amy had parted ways the night of July 2nd. I'm not 100% sure of exactly when David found the bike, but I do believe it was either the night his daughter didn't come home or the following day. Now, the trouble with this particular spot where the bike was found and where Rosie was last seen is that her parents or really anyone that lived near her house or on her street wouldn't have been able to see that area because it's essentially around a bend. And based on early reporting done on the case, there had been a fair amount of foliage in that area as well that would have just completely obscured anyone's view of that spot. And a spokesman for the Fairfax County PD had mentioned of that location, quote, where the bicycle was found is an ideal situation for someone to be grabbed with no one seeing it, end quote. Now, John, I do have a map of that area. Mm -hmm. If you wanted to take a peek at that so you can kind of see, it's a very square street and like set of houses so Mm -hmm. i can see how that would have been a difficult spot to see depending on where you lived on holland's lane yeah if back then was anything like what it looks like now i mean there's a pretty thick row of trees that almost go along the entirety of lake braddock drive yeah so if you were on holland's lane which is you know it kind of runs weird it's like it's like a half a square almost But yeah, if you were trying to go to Holland's Lane or you were on Holland's Lane and you were trying to see Lake Braddock Drive, you would have to see not only through the houses, but also this, you know, thick row of trees. Yeah, exactly. So I can see what they mean about it being this tough spot to see. And I think that also coincides with just like this. It's a literal square of Holland's Lane and Kendrick Lane. Mm -hmm. And And Westport Lane, which runs through it. Straight through it. Exactly. Yeah. So it definitely is unfortunate that Mm -hmm. this is, you know, the spot where she was last seen because technically then the only person that would have seen her would have been her best friend because she dropped her off there, essentially. Yeah. What was the intersection? Lake Braddock and Westport? Or where? Well, so it was at the stop sign, like they said two blocks from her house. So I can only assume that you would count like Lake Braddock Drive as a block and then Westport Lane as a block, Mm -hmm. or you would count Westport Lane as one of those blocks. And then I assume she lived somewhere a little further down Holland's Lane. So you would think like one street and then another. So the intersection, yeah. So the intersection or the stop sign or whatever was probably Lake Braddock Drive and Westport Lane. That's what I believe. I'm not 100% sure on that, but I believe so. All right. And then she would have taken Westport Lane down to Holland's Lane and then back to her house. Exactly. Unless she was cutting through yards and stuff. Uh, Yeah, but there wasn't anything mentioned that there was a shortcut or Mm -hmm. anything like that. So you would assume then that she just took the normal street to get there since especially she was on her bike. Mm Mm-hmm. Now, two days after Rosie had gone missing, at approximately 11 a.m. on Tuesday, July 4th, 1989, an 18-year-old girl named Tracy Burns was driving in the area of Bentonbrook Drive and Edenderry Drive in Fairfax, Virginia, when she saw something on the side of the road that startled her. It looked like there was a body lying on the side of the road amongst a bunch of trees. Tracy drove home and alerted her father, Larry Burns, who went right over to the location where his daughter said this body was, and realized that there was, in fact, a body of a young girl just about 10 feet off the side of the road. It was later confirmed to be Rosie Gordon's body. The Fairfax County Police Department were called to the area immediately and began their investigation into Rosie's death, and they are the PD that has worked the case for the past 33 years. After Rosie was found deceased, her family put out a public statement, which was published in the Washington Post. 
It stated, quote, Rosie's parents, David and Leanne Gordon, thanked our many friends and neighbors who helped us try to find our baby. We wish to remember Rosie singing, laughing, and dancing. Remember her by the pool or wearing her school safety patrol belt and watching out for other children. Keep her in your hearts so she'll never really be gone. Thank you all from the bottom of our hearts. We've come together because of Rosie. Please, let's stay together to protect the rest of our children. End quote. Now, that last comment about staying together to protect the children is something that the community really seemed to take to heart. The Lake Braddock community and other nearby areas were terrified that whoever took Rosie was still out there and were worried their children could now be targets too. Locals felt unsafe in their neighborhood now, which, from what I can tell, seemed to be a pretty safe area. One neighbor who was interviewed for the Washington Post stated, quote, It's very hard to accept. Now what are we going to do with our kids? Now we'll have to walk them out to the park. When my son found out, he yelled, and my daughter started crying. She can't understand, end quote. After this tragedy, parents began implementing a buddy system for their kids and were just keeping a much closer eye on them than they had in the past. And I think this is just a sentiment of the times where parents could just let their kids out and say, OK, come back when the streetlights come on. But at this point, nobody felt comfortable doing that. Mm -hmm. And most kids weren't even allowed to leave their own yards, which today doesn't seem like that big of a deal. If we had children, I probably wouldn't <laughs> let them leave our yard either. But, you know, back then that was a totally different story. So... Yeah, and just to comment on the idea that Holland's Lane looked like such a nice, safe community, it, it looks like suburbia. Like, oh, yeah. The quintessential, you have, you know, this square block of houses mm -hmm. that is right near a lake, and it looks like a nice, safe area. There's not a big city nearby, so mm -hmm. you don't think you're going to have, you know, the city crime coming over. But I was also looking at the distance to and the area of Eden Dairy Drive and Bentonbrook Drive. Mm. It's not that far away. It's about five to six miles away. Yep. But Eden Dairy Drive is like super heavily wooded. Yes. Like whoever was going there had to know the area to go there. Absolutely. And we're going to dive into that in just a few minutes. Now, I did just want to bring up too that the Gordon family and those close to them actually ended up creating a group known as Rosie's Patrol in hopes that they would be able to thwart future attacks and also educate others on the potential dangers in their communities. The Richmond Times-Dispatch reported the following regarding this new group. Quote, In Fairfax County, a new community group called Rosie's Patrol will arrange for adults to watch children as they walk to bus stops. The group, which also is educating children about the dangers of crime, was organized after the abduction and slaying of 10-year-old Rosie Gordon in the Lake Braddock neighborhood in July, said Larry Stevens, the group's president. The purpose of Rosie's patrol is to prevent the abduction of children and to prevent children being used as victims, end quote. All right, let's now review some of the details of this investigation. Within the first week after Rosie was killed, authorities had gotten over 400 leads in the case. And by the end of three weeks, there were over 1,300 leads received. And we'll dive into this more in a little bit, but a lot of these leads were kind of in conjunction with sexual assaults that had occurred in nearby areas within, I would say, like a year, year and a half prior to Rosie's murder. And I think the leads in those cases were also a part of the leads that were coming in in Rosie's case. But before we discuss all that coincides with Rosie's case and these other sexual assaults, let's first touch on the location where Rosie's body was found. John had just brought it up a few minutes ago regarding, you know, this Eden Dairy Drive and that whole area. So the spot was just over five miles from Rosie's home, and it should only take about 12 minutes to drive to that location from where she was last seen. And even though there does appear to be a ton of tree coverage over there, where she was, it wasn't very well concealed. And she was easily spotted on the side of the road. And you have to think that this was also someone driving by, not someone that was walking in the area. So she was still able to see her. Which is so strange mm. not to derail where you're going with yeah. that. But there's only one way in and one way out of this place. Yeah. So I think the girl that was driving through was probably driving home. Right. I would have to think. But I'm thinking whoever put her body there, mm -hmm. that's a bad spot people are going to see you coming in hopefully mm -hmm. people are going to see you leaving exactly that is what stood out to me immediately when i first looked at that area mm -hmm. strange yeah because it's all dead ends like bendenbrook drive comes in off of like a main drag mm. and then all these other streets are just little dead ends off of it and then when you get to edenderry drive it's like 
the end of Benton Brook Drive. Yeah, it is. So it's not the ideal place where if you're trying to conceal, you know, your <laughs> misdeeds, mm-hmm. not the best place to do it. And especially if she was left somewhere that wasn't concealed. Yeah. Definitely a weird place to try and dispose of a body. I agree. And essentially where she was found was under like this little cluster of trees. Obviously, there's so many today. I don't know how many there were back then, but she was still relatively exposed to the road. So she, like they said, only 10 feet from the side of the road. It's not like this person walked even further into the woods to try and conceal her body. And when she was found, I guess the only thing covering her were some leaves that were covering her face. And that guy, Larry Burns, that had gone back to the location once his daughter had come home to tell him about it, had told the Washington Post in regards to the area where Rosie was found, quote, if someone was trying to hide the body, there are a million places here they could drop it off and it wouldn't be so obvious, end quote. That's something that I wanted to make clear because I know a lot of people might not be listening and looking at the map at the same time. Yeah. This location is not somewhere where... You know, you could pull down another street that's kind of hidden and Mm -hmm. off the beaten path, and then you would walk over to this location and leave a body there. There's literally tons of tree coverage off of the roads Mm -hmm. where you could have put the body, and then she wouldn't have been found so easily. Yeah. Like, this is very, very strange that Rosie's body was left here. It makes me think that, and I know I'm, like, jumping to a conclusion, like, so early on, but that... She maybe knew this person or this person had significant remorse for what he had done and left her in a place because he wanted her to be found quickly. Okay, so before we get into like the specifics of what was found at the crime scene and everything like that, Mm -hmm. there's no possibility that she was injured, walked her way to this location and then died from her injuries in that spot. I'm going to be like that detective we talked about in Craig Freer's episode, (laughs) 99.9% chance no. Okay. Yeah, because, I mean, just looking at this place, obviously all these streets may not have been here at the time, which makes it even more strange that the body was left here. Yeah. Like, you have this big golf course over here that has tons of tree coverage around it. You could have went to the end of Meath Drive, and that's another dead end, kind of from the southwest of Edenderry Drive, and there's tons of trees and stuff over there. I mean, Benton Brook Drive itself is a dead end that connects multiple dead ends. Yeah. Like, they're... All dead end streets over here. And this seems like very deep into a neighborhood Mm -hmm. off of Braddock Road, which seems to be a larger thoroughfare. Yeah. I would uh, think. Yeah. It's Route 620, Mm -hmm. which, you know, runs east and west through most of Virginia, it seems like. Yeah. But also, I mean, just thinking about where she was picked up, there's a body of water right there. I know it's surrounded by houses, but so is Eden Dairy Drive. Yeah. You know, it's, um, That's something that's going to stick with me for a while as far as, like, why would this person choose this area? Yeah. I mean, you could have continued on the highway further. You could have... Well, exactly like that guy said, there are a million other places, even where she was found. There's probably even more than a million. Exactly. Completely along this entire route. So that is definitely... I agree with you, John. This is one of the things that absolutely stood out to me from the very beginning And I feel like has kind of framed what I'm thinking about this case as I've worked through it. So Mm -hmm. I feel like it'll probably frame a lot for you too. Okay. So we'll keep that in the back of our mind. Yes. I think everybody gets the gist that this is a very, very strange place for the killer to have left Rosie's body. Absolutely. Let's continue then. Now, another strange thing, especially for authorities who responded to the scene, was that upon visual inspection of Rosie's body, they couldn't identify any marks that might have indicated how she died. In addition, her clothes, which were described as shorts and a t-shirt, looked completely undisturbed. She didn't appear to be in any state of undress, and it didn't look as though her clothes had been removed and haphazardly put back on her. With all that said, Rosie's case was being treated as a homicide from the very beginning. Now, I do also just want to mention that the medical examiner that had arrived on scene after she was found had speculated that Rosie could have been deceased for about 24 hours by the time her body was located, which, based on when she was abducted, could lead you to believe that maybe whoever took her had held her for a short time before she was killed and later placed in this location, which I personally think may have been what happened, but we'll dive more into our opinions later. But Rosie's autopsy was scheduled for the following day, Wednesday, July 5th, and authorities were hoping the ME would be able to determine her cause of death. 
I mean, something else I just want to point out too yeah. is where she was abducted from. Mm -hmm. This is not a place where you would just be driving through to get to another location. No, absolutely not. This is uh, a general neighborhood area. It's an association where, too. So even, you're thinking like HOA so then, probably. Right. I mean, you have all of these other main drags. You have Guinea Road. You have Route 645. Like there are tons of other places mm -hmm. for you to go if you're trying to get to an end location that would not take you here. Whoever abducted her must have been in this area mm -hmm. for some type of reason other than abducting her did they live near there were they visiting somewhere were they did they work prowling nearby? these neighborhoods because they knew that children freely roamed because mm -hmm. it was so safe yeah i mean those are all valid questions there are a lot of questions with this case right. so. it, it doesn't seem like it's happenstance that whoever ended up abducting her mm -hmm. was just there by chance yeah i they totally seem to agree be looking for someone absolutely after the reporting that the autopsy had been completed, I wasn't able to find any further clarification on Rosie's time of death, so I think it's fair to assume that the 24-hour estimation that the ME initially speculated on at the scene is probably relatively accurate. Now, after the completion of the autopsy, Rosie's cause of death was reported publicly, and it was confirmed that she had died by asphyxiation. The ME also stated that she may have been sexually assaulted and that there was, quote, some evidence to indicate that she had been sexually assaulted, but they said further investigation was required, end quote. I mean, she's a 10-year-old girl. Mm -hmm. If there's evidence to believe that she was sexually assaulted, do you really think that she's sexually active mm -hmm. at 10 years old? No, like, what absolutely are the odds? not. Obviously, it's a thing that happens, but yeah. what are the odds? Mm -hmm. So if there's some evidence to believe that it may have happened... I would guess that it probably happened. Yeah, so I think we're leaning along that side of things to say if there's some indication, then it's more than likely that it did happen. Yes, and that's starting to turn the wheels in my head. Mm. Okay, they sexually assaulted her, but got her dressed again, and mm -hmm. she didn't look like she was disheveled. She wasn't in any state of undress. Like, did this person know her? Mm -hmm. And that's why they were in the area. I mean, I, I think know. it's it, fair it seems... to assume. I know we're early on in this episode, but I think it is very fair to assume. Yeah. Now, within the first several weeks after Rosie's body had been found, there was a lot being discussed in the media in terms of who the perpetrator could have been. And simultaneously, there were many reports regarding a potential connection between Rosie's case and those other sexual assault cases I mentioned a few minutes ago. But before we discuss that, I need to first start by providing you with the details of a profile that was produced by the FBI and put out to the public. Before you get into the profile, mm -hmm. did any of these other sexual assaults end in murders? No. Interesting. Yeah. Were they of the same age range as Rosie? Yes. And we're going to dive into those in a little while as well. So you're probably going to get a fair amount of your questions answered. All right. So let's get back to the profile. So it appears as though the FBI had gotten somewhat involved pretty early on in the investigation. And within a short span of time, I'm talking like within two weeks of Rosie's murder, there was a profile generated and put out to the public. Now, I don't know if the PD had contacted the FBI to put together this profile in regards to just Rosie's case specifically, or if it was a request from multiple jurisdictions in conjunction with the other sexual assaults, but it was stated that authorities, as well as the FBI agent who produced the profile, believed whoever killed Rosie had also committed these other sexual assaults. Okay, so I'm thinking maybe because all these sexual assaults have been taking place, presumably with young girls. Yes, now that this has escalated to a murder, mm -hmm. they're like, okay, this is only going to get worse. The local police agencies may have been like, we had a serial sexual assault or a serial rapist already, and now he's turned to murder. Mm -hmm. We should probably get the FBI in here. So they may have done it on their own because that's a bad spot to be in. Yeah, absolutely. So a man by the name of John Douglas put together this profile, and he was a supervisor at the National Center for the Analysis of Violent Crime at the FBI Academy in Quantico. The Richmond Times-Dispatch provided details regarding the profile, so pretty much all the information I'm going to bring up now came from reporting in that publication. So, to begin, the article stated, quote, The person who killed Rhiannon and Gordon is a loner who drinks too much, has low self-esteem, and preys on girls because they are vulnerable, end quote. Loner, probable alcoholic, mm -hmm. low self-esteem. Yes, preys on girls because they're vulnerable. Hmm. You think of vulnerable, you think of somebody that's, you know, like, in emotional distress and you're taking advantage of them. Mm -hmm. But vulnerable also could be a 10-year-old girl by herself on the side of the road. Yes, exactly. I think that might be where they're leaning here. Okay. 
So the article continues and says that the suspect is, quote, sloppy and disheveled, works in a low paying job and has not had a normal relationship with women his own age. The rapist targets girls he believes can be easily manipulated and dominated because it is important he feel in control, end quote. Makes sense why he's choosing young girls then. Mm -hmm, For sure. The profile also indicated that this man likely felt comfortable with where he was abducting the girls from, but it did not necessarily mean that he was living in that area at that time. Makes me think about what businesses are in this area. What could a sloppy, alcoholic, disheveled man who's practically an incel, where would they be working? Mm -hmm. You think some low-tier, bad-pay job. It makes me think of Victor Winetti. From Tammy Mm. Belanger's case and how, you know, he had this sordid history and when he came back up to New Hampshire, he got a job as just like a mechanic Mm -hmm. and wasn't making a ton of money. And like I could see something like that, like maybe a factory worker Mm -hmm. or a mechanic or something along those lines is kind of what's coming into my head. Janitor. A janitor, yep. I was thinking, okay, hear me out. Are you Lake looking Braddock at the church? Secondary school? Okay, I was oh, thinking you were the thinking church. True detective. Yeah, yeah, like the guy that um, mowed the lawn. Yeah. And you yes. know, no one ever looked at him. So landscaping, that yeah. would make perfect sense. Yeah, so we're talking, you know, something where it's probably manual labor. Yep. That pays poorly. Mm-hmm. And probably gets dirty on the job. Yeah. So like him talking. looking disheveled, that kind of thing. And when he gets out of it, he's like, oh, I need a beer. Or I need a whiskey. Or yeah. I need whatever. Yeah. So, yeah, I think, you know, maybe some type of mechanic, some type of groundskeeper, some type of janitor, something maybe in that realm. Mm-hmm. And um, I think when you said the church, that's a possibility. But I'm also looking at just northeast of Holland's Lane is Lake Braddock Secondary School. Mm-hmm. So you could also look at schools, too. And if this guy is, you know, an elementary school employee. Mm-hmm. And he sees all of these young girls. And janitors are at the schools during the summer, I'm pretty sure. Because obviously this is now 4th of mm-hmm. July. So yeah. so something to think about. Definitely. Who knows? And if this is an HOA, what if it's the person that cuts the grass? I- exactly. Yeah, because you would have to hire out for that, right. most likely. I mean, unless they required everyone to mow their own lawns. I don't really know how HOAs <laughs> work. To, I've never right. lived in one. So. I just know people hate HOAs. <laughs> yes, defund the <laughs> HOA. <laughs> but... um. To go along with the FBI's profile, I think some of the jobs that we have been listing make sense. Yeah, they all fit under the umbrella of what they're describing. Right. All right, so John Douglas, the guy who created the profile, he also wanted to alert the public to keep watch for people who acted in suspicious ways after the rapes that took place over the past year and a half. And he described those strange behaviors as post-offense characteristics. And that's something that we actually talk about all the time. I specifically remember talking about it in Michael Kleiman's case. For example, like a suspect changing the way they look or cutting their hair, dyeing Mm -hmm. their hair, or being enveloped in media coverage on a particular case after the fact. Mm -hmm. So those are those kind of post-offense characteristics that Douglas was talking about. Yeah, maybe like taking part in the searches. Yes, exactly. And there were two particular behaviors that were mentioned in the profile, and they were that the offender may have attempted to leave the area and that he could have been drinking even more heavily than he had already been because now he's stressed because Mm -hmm. he knows authorities are looking for him. They're kind of putting two and two together with this whole situation. Mm -hmm. It was also brought up that this guy was pretty careless when it came to what he was doing, but now that authorities were looking for him, he was going to stay close to where he was comfortable which I thought kind of like discounted the last comment that was made regarding right. if he wants he to might stay where he's comfortable, area. why is he going to want to leave the area? Yeah, exactly. So I was like, okay, that one's a little tough for me to 100% agree with, but. But when building the profile, the fact that he is an alcoholic yeah. makes a lot of sense because he could be totally blown out while he's trying to dispose of Rosie's body, mm-hmm. goes down a dead end and he's just like, well, oh, whatever. There's nobody out here right now. I'm just going to leave her right here and. The middle of a neighborhood with one way in and one way out. That actually makes perfect sense. That wasn't anything I had thought of. Good point, for Mm -hmm. sure. Also, like I mentioned a minute ago, the man that this profile described was not only for the offender in Rosie's case. It was for the man that they believed, yeah, exactly, had committed these other sexual assaults as well as now Rosie's murder, like John said before as well. Now, if this is in fact true, this person has escalated to a new level. Right. Which is concerning. Absolutely. I mean, the prior sexual assaults were concerning Mm -hmm. to begin with, 
but now you have the fact that he killed the 10 year old girl yeah if this is the same person which it appears as though authorities believe it is yeah that's like we need all hands on deck let's call the fbi hopefully they can build a profile yep and then that helps narrow down our search as to who we're looking for yeah you're not going to look for you know the accountant with four kids and a wife that goes to church every sunday Mm -hmm. you're going to be looking for the guy that's an alcoholic that always looks dingy that's kind of hanging around the area low paying job can't keep a relationship with any women his own age yep it really helps narrow down the pool of suspects if that profile is accurate definitely yeah and i did just want to mention too we're not going to talk about it just yet but when we get into discussing the other sexual assaults that took place there were four cases all from multiple jurisdictions still relatively close to the fairfax area but the mo in those cases was identical the same thing happened in every single one so that's just something to keep in the back of your mind but now that you know some of the characteristics of the man authorities were looking for i can now paint a better picture for you because there was also a physical description of the man put out to the public i hope he didn't have scars on the bottom half of his face and look like the no, uh, green no. man. No, but there is actually somebody else that came to mind. So, Ever since we started talking about the profile and how it could have been like a groundskeeper or something like that, now all I'm thinking about is the suspect from True Detective Season 1. Yeah, yeah, that's not what's in my head. So, But it's because I, I know more about this case. But all right, well, I totally hopefully see you'll why. change my mind then. Yeah, so it was reported that police were, quote, seeking an overweight white male between the ages of 30 and 40, about 5 foot 10, with a pot belly and nicotine stained teeth, end quote. It was later reported that the man had a quote, crudely drawn red and blue tattoo of a flower or a tree on his upper arm, end quote. Now, the one person that came to mind when I read that description was, and I, I totally know that John's going to get this reference, and I wonder if any of our listeners are, but in an episode of Criminal Minds with Tim Curry. Ugh, the teeth. The teeth. And he plays the unsub, Billy Flynn. And just thinking about this physical description of this man, also knowing what the FBI has put out in this profile, like, this guy had to be so scary. And gross. And gross. It's horrible. It's so horrible. Mm -hmm. Now, it was also reported that authorities were interested in tracking down a car that was supposedly seen in the area near Rosie's home the day she was abducted. And that car was described as being a metallic blue four-door sedan. It was mentioned that other cars were being sought in those other sexual assault cases, but it was unclear if this blue car in particular was being strictly sought in relation to Rosie's case or any of the others. Either way, after this information was reported regarding the profile and the physical description of the guy police were after, There was a surprising influx of reporting regarding arrests made in the area stemming from other sexual assaults that had occurred. The first arrest was reported about three weeks after Rosie was killed, but this arrest wasn't in connection with any of the other attacks we've discussed thus far. But the man who was arrested was 24-year-old Ricardo Aguirre, and he was arrested and charged with abduction with intent to defile. Based on the very brief reporting on this guy, he'd allegedly attempted to abduct a 14-year-old girl, had pulled her into the woods near her home, which was in Tyson's Corner, Virginia, and started kissing her. But thankfully, authorities were driving by the area as this was happening and saw the two struggling, so they pulled over to stop the attack. Talk about right place at the right time. Right? But of course, this guy fled. But thankfully, authorities were able to track him down shortly after the incident, and he was subsequently arrested. I wonder if this girl was known to him. Yeah, I'm not sure. I don't think so, but I'm not totally positive on that. Mm -hmm. But authorities did state that they did not believe that this Ricardo guy was the man responsible for the murder of Rosie or for any of the other rapes in the area. But police spokesman Warren Carmichael stated for the press, quote, There is no immediate indication of any connection, but any possibility of a connection will be thoroughly investigated, end quote. Based on the minimal reporting regarding this whole thing, it doesn't look like the investigation into this guy really went anywhere, and authorities seem to remove him from their radar, but it's totally unclear if he was ever actually cleared of involvement. So, just to throw this out there, Mm -hmm. and I'm sure investigators have thought of this, but I don't know if you have during your process of researching this case, Mm -hmm. we talked about jobs that this suspect could have. Mm -hmm. If he was a mechanic and people were dropping their cars off, And leaving them there for an extended period of time. Mm. You would have access to keys. I didn't even think of that. You would take that vehicle. 
perhaps use it in commission of the crimes that he was committing. Mm -hmm. So then if you had one girl that was abducted in a tan SUV, another that was abducted in a metallic blue four-door sedan, then another that was a white minivan, always a different vehicle, could he have been doing it using somebody else's car that had been dropped off for service? That's a great point to make. And it definitely didn't pop into my head and I don't know about authorities because nothing like that had ever been reported, but Mm -hmm. I think that's an excellent point to make. Just an idea. It's a great idea. Now, just a short time later, about six weeks after Rosie's murder, another arrest was made and this was a big one and we're going to spend a fair amount of time discussing it. But I got to say, the initial reporting on this was kind of all over the place with several articles literally reporting that authorities had arrested the man that murdered Rosie Gordon. Oh, geez. But then as you, you know, start reading the article, you realize that the author kind of like started changing their tune throughout the piece. And they were saying, oh, well, he hasn't been charged. He might not be the guy. Mm -hmm. But like, you know, the headlines literally (laughs) murderer captured or whatever. Mm -hmm. So. All in all, it really was a little bit confusing at first, but once the media kind of checked itself and stopped assuming things and just put out the information that was provided by investigators, it seemed as though accurate information started to be reported again. They just needed the clickbait at the beginning. That's what it seemed like. It's like, murderer captured, and a question mark that looks very similar to an exclamation point. (laughs) Yeah, very true, very true. But despite the fact that this man wasn't being arrested and charged with Rosie's murder at this point in time, authorities did say, quote, We feel confident we have accomplished our primary objective of removing from our midst an individual posing a threat to the safety of our children, end quote. But all right, let's talk about who was arrested, why he was being arrested, and then we'll tackle everything that transpired after the initial arrest. So on August 17th, 1989, about a month and a half after Rosie was killed, authorities arrested a 28-year-old carpenter from Dale City, Virginia, which was only about 16 miles or a 26-minute drive from Burke, Virginia, where Rosie lived. And this guy was named Randall Breer. Now, Randall Breer was not originally arrested for the murder of Rosie, nor was he arrested for the sexual assaults that occurred in the area. He was actually under arrest for a parole violation as well as auto theft. Based on reporting that John John just gave me eyebrows and it makes sense what he was just talking about with the cars. So again, keep the auto theft thing in the back of your mind. But based on reporting done regarding Breer, he apparently had quite an extensive criminal history and there were multiple charges and convictions against him in both New York and Vermont. And the Vermont crimes were reported to be sexual in nature. Now, after Breer's initial arrest in August of 89, authorities did almost immediately begin charging him with those other sexual assaults. I had mentioned before that there were four in total in neighboring counties that were being looked into for a possible connection to Rosie's case. So I do want to back up a little bit and talk about those sexual assaults before we delve into the details of Randall's arrest, charges, and other info that came out after he was in custody. So there were four cases in total that multiple jurisdictions had concluded were more than likely connected. Two from Arlington County, one from Alexandria County, and one from Loudoun County. All three of these counties were within less than an hour driving distance to Fairfax County where Rosie was killed, two of which were like under 20 minute drives, so definitely close proximity. The first sexual assault took place back on July 20th, 1988 in Arlington when a 13 year old girl was abducted at knife point brought to a secluded location and sexually assaulted. After the attack, she was then brought back to the area where she was taken from. The other three sexual assaults that happened after all pretty much matched the first in the way the perpetrator had abducted them and what transpired. So like I mentioned a little while ago, the MO was nearly identical in every single sexual assault. I have to say, Mm -hmm. Randall does not seem too bright. Yes, he's not at all obviously we never want to see these types of crimes happen Mm -hmm. but if you're going to abduct someone take them to a rural location sexually assault them and then return them to their doorstep or wherever they were abducted from that's pretty freaking stupid it's easy to get caught yeah i mean it's it's very similar to going to drop a body down a dead end and having to leave the way you just came Mm -hmm. yeah so i mean all of these things are reasons why authorities are looking at him Mm -hmm. and investigating him in relation to Rosie's case as well. And probably why he ended up getting charged with some of these other sexual assaults, because that MO was the same, and Mm -hmm. it's like, 
who else would do this? It, exactly, yeah. So then on February 4th, 1989, another girl who was a bit older at 19 years old was abducted from a location in Alexandria County. Again, same thing as the last one. She was abducted at knife point, taken to a secluded location, sexually assaulted, and dropped back off. Another attack happened just a short time later on February 20th, 1989, this time in Loudoun County. Again, exact same MO. And the final case was another out of Arlington County when on May 4th, 1989, an 11-year-old girl had been abducted, again, in the exact same way as the first three. Like I mentioned before, but I'll just reiterate it, the perpetrator would abduct the girls at knife point. He brought them to a secluded location or a rural-type location. He raped and or sodomized them, would then bring them back to the area where he abducted them from and drop them off. But it was reported that several of the girls were given a quarter by their attacker so they could make a call to their parents to come get them. That's so messed up. It's beyond messed up. Now, if we're thinking that Randall is good for most of these sexual assaults, Mm -hmm. if he's abducting these girls, bringing them to a secluded area, Mm -hmm. and then bringing them back, I mean, we're talking 88, 89. Yep. No GPS. You got to know where you're going. Yes. You can't just wander around somewhere and look for a wooded area and, I to mean, sexually I guess assault you could, someone. But in that situation. But then how are you going to find yourself back? It, yeah, very true. So I think uh, that kind of fits the profile mm-hmm. that the attacker for these sexual assaults and maybe Rosie's murder as well mm-hmm. is comfortable or familiar with the area. Yeah. And I think just knowing that also makes you wonder. Again, with the profile where it said that he's comfortable with this area, but he might not live there. Mm -hmm. Could he live in one of these areas? Because obviously it's multiple counties, multiple jurisdictions. Could he or could he have lived there as a child? That's up. And and then moved away as an adult. Or does their work take them places? Like He's a carpenter. Right. So like, does he just work out of a shop or does he go places and do work at people's houses? And Mm -hmm. Is he scouting these areas as he's traveling to these different locations to, you know, build a fence or a barn or whatever? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, all possible. Now, the description I had given you earlier for the man authorities were looking for came from descriptions provided by, I believe, all of the girls who were attacked by him. And one of the girls, I believe it was the 11-year-old from Loudoun County who was attacked in late February of 89, she provided authorities with a description of the man's car as well. She stated that he drove a tan Plymouth Turismo that had an inspection sticker with the number 10 on it. According to an Associated Press piece that ran in the Daily Press, authorities had actually compiled over 200,000 inspection sticker records based on the information provided to them by this 11-year-old, and they then had to work through all of these records by hand to dwindle down the list of vehicles in the area to the type of car and the inspection sticker information Mm -hmm. that she provided to them. Interesting. Now, I think I'm not a car buff, but I know usually know the car when we talk about a car. I have no idea what a Plymouth Turismo is until you send me this picture. (laughs) And for all you listening, it kind of looks like a knockoff DeLorean. Yeah, a little bit. And it's smaller than I expected. Mm -hmm. Um, Two doors. Yeah, two doors and kind of a little sporty Mm. hatchback. And I don't know what year it was either. So it was just said that it was a Plymouth Turismo. It could have been anywhere you know, in the 70s or 80s mm-hmm. type model, but... But yeah, it does look like a DeLorean for a vehicle that's more well-known, you know, mm. back to the future. Yeah. All right, so back to the whole inspection sticker situation, you know, how yep. authorities are going through over 200,000 records. So it was reported that this process took them months. But after Rosie was killed, the urgency in finding this guy grew even more because, like we talked about a little while ago, if the profile was correct and it's the same guy that's sexually assaulting these girls that also killed Rosie, then you're thinking that he has now escalated quite significantly in a short span of time. So they're like, all right, we need to get on this. We need to find this guy. Right. And even if he escalated because of something that specifically happened with Rosie. Yeah. Now he has done that once. He's broken the threshold. Yes. He can and probably will kill again. Yes. So at this point, authorities were pushing harder to shorten that list, and they were able to locate 92 cars that matched the description within the state. But after further investigation, it was confirmed that there was only one in the specific county they needed. And ding, 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 you guessed it, that car belonged to Randall Breer. Talk about the perfect 
piece of information that this girl was able to yep. piece out and remember yep. and give to authorities. Mm -hmm. Her mom was interviewed and I'm pretty sure she was like, my daughter knew what she saw and she told the authorities mm -hmm. what she saw and she was steadfast in what she knew. And I'm so proud of her. Right. And it's not like she saw a description of a man mm -hmm. and was able to describe her attacker or something like that. She had an identifying characteristic that was on one particular car in one particular county yep. that authorities were able to narrow down to. Yep. That's great. It is great. I mean, that's what you hope for. Good witnesses. Yep. Good witnesses for or sure. Or victims. Yeah, so. I know. It's a shitty situation, but at least she was very aware of her surroundings right. in that situation. And to be only 11 and, and be think able about to do those that, things. Though. Yeah. Like, you I, think could, about, I couldn't imagine being that way at 11. No, when shit hits the fan, it's like condition black. You're not even paying attention and stuff. You're just worried about surviving. Exactly. And for her to be able to see these things and recall them and, you know, not have them locked in the recesses of her memory mm -hmm. because of the traumatic event that occurred. Yeah. That's commendable to say the least. Absolutely. So at this point, investigators somehow tracked Breer down and found out that he had left his car at an auto dealer in the Woodbridge, Virginia area, and I guess it was being serviced there. Authorities were actually waiting at the dealership for Breer when he came back to pick up his car and subsequently arrested him. But I do just want to mention before we move on that I was a little confused when I was researching this aspect of the case because there were reports that Breer had owned several different types of cars, one obviously being the Tan Turismo, which is essentially what got him caught. But it was also mentioned that he, at one point, owned a 1977 Oldsmobile Cutlass, which was said to have been used in the attack on the 13-year-old girl back in 1988. However, reporting stated that he had traded in one of his cars, and it was also mentioned that he'd left one of his cars at a repair shop and just never picked it back up and had recently purchased a new vehicle, which was the car that was at the dealership where he was arrested, so we don't really know which car he owned at the time of his arrest, if maybe the Turismo is what he traded in or what. But we know that at some point he owned those two cars, and that's essentially what nailed him for this crime. So here's something else that I think is weird. So when Randall was arrested, it was stated that he was a, quote, excellent match to the FBI profile, and that he looked like the description provided of the man that assaulted the other girls, which included the tattoo, and he was even arrested wearing some of the clothing that was described by the victims as well. Now, John, I actually have a photo of him here for you so you can take a look. Not at all what I pictured, honestly. Okay. Hmm. Thinner well, than I would have thought. Okay, so hear me out, though. Yeah. You can this still is have totally, a pot belly and be thin. <laughs> yeah, that, uh, yes, exactly. This is totally me, like, profiling people. Yeah. But I know a kid that I actually went to school with. Yeah. You look at his face, you probably think he's 120 pounds, yeah. but he's got like an alien pot belly because he drinks all the time. Okay, all right, okay. You know, so I would say he kind of looks a little disheveled. I could actually see the potential that he may be under the influence just on his eyes. Yeah, in, in this that picture, photo, yeah. Which this is probably his booking photo, so if he was arrested and then processed mm -hmm. and photographed right after that, he could be under the influence of alcohol at that time. Mm -hmm. So it's tough to gauge what I would have thought just on a facial picture. Yeah, this is very true. I agree. But if he's meeting all these other things outside of, you know, physical appearance. Yep. You know, a profile I don't think will ever be 100%, 100% of the time. Mm hmm But this seems good so far. Yes, definitely. So the day after Breer was arrested, which was August 18th, 1989, the Richmond Times-Dispatch reported that authorities called a, quote, unusual news conference. And during that press conference is when the Fairfax County PD announced that Randall Breer was their prime suspect in Rosie Gordon's murder. And this kind of goes back to what I was talking about earlier regarding the wishy-washy reporting about authorities having their guy. At this stage in their investigation, they were not charging him, but they were confirming publicly that he was their main suspect. So investigators were? Yes. Not just the news people? Correct. This was a press conference put out by the Fairfax County PD. Which kind of aligns with what they've been saying the whole time because they stated that they believe that whoever has been sexually assaulting all these other young girls mm -hmm. was the one that killed Rosie. So, I mean, it aligns with what they have been saying almost from the get-go, but I feel like it's not going to end here. You're right. There is a but. So, as time went on, the case against Breer for Rosie's murder specifically didn't appear to get any stronger. It honestly got weaker, 
and more details came out that could lead you to believe that maybe Randall wasn't the guy that was responsible for Rosie's murder, even though investigators seemed pretty steadfast in their belief that he was. But the biggest thing that came out that would likely lead you down the path of thinking he was not involved is the fact that he had an alibi during the time that Rosie was abducted. At the time, he'd been working for a company called CNN Enterprises, which was essentially a home improvement company in the Woodbridge, Virginia area. And on Sunday, July 2nd, the same day Rosie Gordon was abducted, Randall Breer was over 25 miles away at an office party at his employer's home, which was said to be in Stafford County, Virginia. It was reported that Randall had been at the party from early afternoon until about 1130 or midnight that night. Several of his co-workers did vouch for him and stated that he had been there that night and they provided the times he was there, all that. And I will say, too, that reporting on the case mentioned that these co-workers were, quote unquote, believable. And it was reported in The Washington Post that the county prosecutor at the time, Robert Horan Jr., said, quote, Breer's alibi is solid and was provided by decent people who really have no reason to lie, end quote. OK, that makes me believe the alibi more. Because mm-hmm. I was thinking, okay, did he have an alibi from one person? And could this person have been an accomplice in any of these crimes that he has committed? Whether it be the auto theft that he was on parole for or whatever, or the sexual assaults that he is now being charged with. Mm-hmm. So knowing that these are normal people that have no reason to lie about his whereabouts at the time. Yeah. Make me believe that, okay, this alibi probably is solid. Yeah. And not only were there those co-workers vouching for him saying that he was there, but I guess There were like one or two reports about this, so I don't know exactly how accurate it is, but there was supposedly some sort of like security guard there. I don't know if he was like keeping track of the parking lot and how many cars were there. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if it was like a valet type situation. I don't know how much money the owner of this business had or something, but Mm -hmm. he had supposedly kept track of the cars that were there and had pointed out to authorities that he had remembered seeing Breer's car in the lot essentially the whole time. Okay. That he said he was at the party. So, I mean, it seems like even a relatively that, good alibi. So yeah, yeah, but even without the security guard or the valet person or whatever, mm. I find no reason to discount the alibi. I agree. Normal, everyday people that have no connection to this guy said that he was there. Yeah. Now, ever since the Fairfax County Police Department held that press conference to announce that Breer was their number one suspect, the county prosecutor, the guy that I just mentioned, Attorney Horan, He was very vocal about how much he disagreed with authorities even naming Randall Breer as a suspect and the fact that he didn't think that Breer was involved in Rosie's murder at all. I mean, yeah, why jump right to a suspect if you could have called him a person of interest? I agree. So at one point, Attorney Horan had mentioned that the evidence against Breer was quote unquote circumstantial at best. And the Richmond Times Dispatch reported another comment that Attorney Horan made, quote, I disagreed with the decision to go public because there was not enough evidence to charge him in the crime. If, in fact, the girl was abducted on Sunday, July 2nd, which has been the theory all along, it would appear he's not the man. There is no evidence other than a theory to tie him to the crime, end quote. That's such a blanket quote or line that I feel like so many attorneys use. Mm. That evidence is circumstantial at best. (laughs) I agree. I agree. Okay, hear me out, bro. (laughs) You can lay up a mountain of circumstantial evidence and it may convince a jury. I I agree. I agree completely. So, I mean, circumstantial at best, yes. If you're looking at it from a black and white perspective, circumstantial isn't enough. There's still reasonable doubt when there's circumstantial. But you lay up enough circumstantial evidence against somebody and paint them to be a terrible person... A jury's going to convict him. (laughs) Alex Murdoch. Uh, Yeah, this is true. So. All right. Pretty much right after Breer had been arrested, a grand jury was convened and he was indicted on multiple rape, abduction, and sodomy charges in relation to the four other sexual assaults that had taken place. His first hearing was for only a handful of charges, but a bunch would come later. And after he was indicted, he was held on $125,000 bail. As time went on, authorities continued to interview Breer, and he finally cracked and confessed to the four sexual assaults, but would only admit to sodomy, not rape, in those cases, at first. But during these interrogations, Breer vehemently denied killing Rosie. 
And the information about his confession actually came out in November of 1989 when a tape of it was played in court. It was reported that on the recording, Breer had stated, quote, I did not touch that girl. I've never seen that girl. I did not beat that girl, end quote. Also, according to Prosecutor Horan, Breer had said at one point regarding the confessions and his denial of Rosie's murder, quote, I'm willing to admit to what I did, but I didn't do that one. End quote. Yeah, I mean, just by him, unless he's like playing 4D chess, by him putting in that line, I didn't beat her. Okay, so I'm so glad she you brought beaten. that up. Exactly. I was like, he doesn't know enough about the case then. Right. So yeah, I mean, I think that there is merit to believe that his alibi is good. And it appears as though mm-hmm. he doesn't know enough about the case to try and formulate some lie I agree, yeah. To remove himself from it. Mm -hmm. So Randall Breer's attorney did try to get the confession tape thrown out to not be able to be used in court because, quote, police kept questioning him after he said he thought he should have an attorney, end quote. Idiots. Right? But. Well, he didn't ask for an attorney. He asked, should I have an attorney? Yes. So the same article then stated. Semantics. I I know. So then the same article later stated, quote, prosecutors maintained that Breer did not answer when asked if he wanted an attorney and rekindled conversations, end quote. All he wanted to do was watch WrestleMania. I know. Oh, God, that I have such a strong opinion on confessions and coerced confessions and things like that. And John and I were recently talking about doing another media type review and we were briefly discussing the confession tapes, which I've watched already. John has not. But if that's something that you guys are interested in, I have a lot of opinions on confessions. So yeah. if you want us to cover the confession tapes, even if it's just like one episode or something, definitely let us know. Yeah. And I think that um, just to keep content fresh, and I know we've talked about this briefly in another episode here and there, but you know, with a lot of unsolved cases, sometimes there is overlap and you don't want to be, you know, talking about a different case, but have the same similarities over and over again. As far as like varying up the content, Mm. um, we are open to suggestions as far as, you know, do you want to watch a fiction-based movie that is true crime adjacent? Do you want us to review that and talk about that? Would you like us to watch the confession tapes and do a little bit of a dive into that case in general and talk about the episode or whatever? But um, we are always open to suggestions as far as content goes. And as long as it aligns with our values and what we're looking to do with the podcast, we are more than happy to take a look at it. Definitely. So let us know. Yes, please do. Okay, so back to Breer and the confession tape. So ultimately, they were going to allow the tape into court, and two of the trials had been scheduled for the end of 1989. Now, apparently, there was also DNA evidence in a couple of these cases that directly linked Breer to the sexual assaults with physical evidence, but it was reported that there was no such evidence in Rosie's case which I'm not sure if that meant there was no DNA found on her in general or if it meant that there wasn't a match to Breer in particular. But despite the reporting that trials were getting scheduled, that changed pretty quickly when Randall Breer took a plea deal. And he pled guilty to multiple charges in these rape cases. And he also ended up confessing to another sexual assault of a girl from Prince William County. So that would be five in total now. Authorities had been hopeful that Breer would take a plea deal to avoid trial and so that the girls did not have to testify and endure the trauma of what happened to them all over again. Now, in terms of Breer's sentencing, during that hearing, a psychiatrist did actually testify regarding his crimes, and he explained that Breer had a, quote, cravings disorder in which he experiences recurrent eroticized cravings for children, end quote. This psychiatrist also testified that Breer was a very dangerous individual and that if he was released from prison, he would absolutely commit these same crimes again. And Breer did actually end up getting sent to a prison where he could obtain treatment as well. I wonder if that testimony took place before or after taking the plea deal and agreeing to it. Because if he agreed to this plea deal and then the psychiatrist comes in and he literally bolts the lock to the door of this Mm. guy's cell and is like, yeah, he took a plea deal, but he should never be let out because he will absolutely commit these crimes again. I think it was after. I think it was at his sentencing hearing. Imagine being Randall and like, what the hell? I thought I was taking a plea deal and I was going to be out in like 40 years or something. Yeah. And now I am never getting out of here because of whatever this guy said. Well, yeah. So now I'm going to dive into his sentences. So 
he received multiple sentences. So I'm going to list them out here for you now. He received a sentence of 30 years for sodomy and 20 years for abduction in the 19-year-old girl's case from February of 89. He received four life sentences for rape, abduction, and sodomy in the 11-year-old girl's case from Loudoun County in February of 89. And one of those sentences was suspended. And for the 11-year-old and... <laughs> what? Uh, yeah, I don't I don't. Why really the know. hell would you ever suspend a life sentence? It's like, hey, if you ever get out on these three life sentences, if you're a bad boy, you're going to go away for another life sentence. Yeah, I honestly have no idea. The justice system boggles my mind sometimes. It's very confusing sometimes. And concurrent sentences pisses me off too. I agree. So then he also got for the 11-year-old girl and the 13-year-old girl from Arlington County, he was sentenced to seven consecutive life sentences for those cases. Good. Good riddance. Yeah. But so here's the thing. He decided to take this plea deal because I think because he was able to have several of the rape charges dropped because based on reporting done for the Washington Post, Virginia law at the time stated that if an individual had three or more rape convictions, there was a mandatory life without parole sentence required for those. But due to the fact that he pled down, he was able to be eligible for parole after 20 years. That's bullshit. Yeah. So spoiler alert, I was actually able to find a document from the Virginia Department of Corrections regarding parole decisions. And as of December of 2021, Randall Breer had been denied parole. So I do think he is still in prison as of today. That's good. I'm glad that he was denied parole and I hope it continues. I agree. Yeah. Like on that. the document, it said something along the lines of you need to do more you don't do enough like within trying to better mm -hmm. yourself and you need to serve more of your sentence. Yes. And I understand that like sentencing and the justice system and everything is a touchy subject, but Virginia had this, if you're convicted of three rapes or sexual assaults or whatever, mm -hmm. then you don't get parole. Yeah. We pretty much know that this guy did more than three. Yes. Why even give him the plea deal? I know the plea deal saves money and victims don't have to relive their trauma. But God forbid, I know this guy gets out in 20 years and then he goes on to commit more crimes. I know it's a, it's a really tough situation, but I think this also goes back to like what you were saying before. If he wanted parole, parole seemed like his number one goal here. Like he mm -hmm. knew he was going to get a lot of time. So I don't think he would have ever taken any sort of plea deal in regards to Rosie's case mm -hmm. because all of these sexual assaults on top of a murder, he would never have gotten out. You I mean, he's so. already not getting out, but still. Right. So, you know, I just think I just hate the fact that you can have these terrible people commit atrocities mm -hmm. that people have to live with. Their victims have to live with the rest of their lives yep. if they're still alive. Mm -hmm. And there's a chance that this guy can get out and do it again. Yeah, it's ridiculous. And we could honestly sit here and gripe all day about that. But let's keep going with the story. So once Breer had confessed and all of that was kind of working its way through the judicial system, the Gordon family began to express their feelings about the fact that they did not believe Randall Breer was involved in their daughter's murder, and they felt as though whoever had done this was just getting away with it and was still out there. The Richmond Times-Dispatch reported, quote, We are highly skeptical that Randall Breer had anything to do with Rosie's abduction and murder, said Julie Calloway, a close friend of the Gordon family. As far as the Gordons and Calloways are concerned, we just don't believe they have the right man, end quote. And the same article continues, quote, Despite their frustration, Miss Calloway said the Gordons are pleased that some good came from their suffering. Breer is no longer on the streets, end quote. I don't know. I think that uh, I would be more, if I was in their position, I would be more pissed off than anything. I don't think that I would have their same outlook to be positive and to say, we're glad that some good came out of the tragedy that happened to our daughter. I think that obviously I would feel that like, okay, well, at least some good has come from this, but there's still a lot more that needs to happen because yeah. this person that killed our daughter is still out there. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah. But you have to remember too, at this point, it's also not that far into the investigation because Breer was arrested in August. A lot of the info and like the confessions were coming out around November. Mm -hmm. So they're not super deep into this investigation yet. And obviously they're thinking, OK, authorities kind of have their eggs in the wrong basket. That's what we think. Yeah. But, you know, especially they with still the alibi. Have time. Yeah. They still have time to change these things. Mm -hmm. Maybe they do. Maybe they don't take what you will from that. We'll talk about it in a few minutes. But, yeah. you know, 
I now want to move on to something that came out exactly one year after Rosie's murder. Okay. And it was a big piece of info. And it surprisingly wasn't something that was being brought to light to the public by the police. It was actually being discussed by Rosie's family and her best friend, Amy, the girl that she was with the day she was kidnapped. So apparently just a few hours prior to when Rosie was taken, she and Amy had noticed someone following them that was driving in a blue car. Now, first of all, do you remember how earlier we were talking about what Rosie and Amy were doing that afternoon and then the two of them walked back to Rosie's house to pick up her bike? Mm -hmm. Well, that happened around 4 p.m. that Sunday. And on their way back to Amy's house, they noticed this car that was acting suspicious and seemed to be following them. Of course, the girls were totally freaked out by it and they veered off path towards a, I guess it was like a townhouse development and they hid somewhere in there. And Amy was actually interviewed for the Washington Post. And when asked about that whole situation, like how her and Rosie reacted to it, she stated, quote, we just sort of pretended we were playing. We just kind of said, well, that was scary, end quote. Hmm. I mean, what do you think? I mean, at 10, 10 years old. Exactly. That's exactly right. how a kid would respond. And she was like 12 when she was being interviewed for that. Yeah. So, but yeah, it's just like such a, a tough situation. But if you also remember, I had made a comment about a blue car. A that metallic blue car. Yes, that authorities were interested in locating. We talked about that way, way earlier on, but we didn't know too, too much about it or really what it had to do with the investigation at that point. But now knowing this and knowing that information is coming directly from Amy about what she remembers seeing the day her best friend was taken, it makes me believe that authorities were putting out a plea to the public in the beginning, just saying like, oh, did you see this metallic blue car? But they weren't totally honed in on that potentially being the guy the yet. Car. Yeah. yeah. And there just wasn't a lot of reporting about it in general, which I was surprised by. But if you also look back and see how quickly they honed in on Breer, mm -hmm. it seems like the blue car just didn't fit the theory of Breer being the guy that was involved. Also, not only was this car seen by Amy and Rosie when they believed it was following them, the same car was also seen by several neighbors and they saw it sitting on Lake Braddock Drive. And that is the little intersection at the stop sign mm -hmm. where Rosie's bike was found and where she was taken from. I think the blue car means a lot more than anyone had said up until this point. Yes, and you also need to think too, like if this is an HOA or if this is a neighborhood where you know there's really no reason for other vehicles outside of residents or visitors to mm -hmm. be there, like you'll spot a car that's out of the ordinary in the area. Definitely. It's like... Okay, nobody's ever there in that blue car, and it's not even parked in front of a house, or mm -hmm. it's just randomly parked and some, you know, dingy-looking guy is sitting in it. Yep. That seems weird. Absolutely. And I'm just surprised that more information wasn't put out to the public by that point, and that's why I just made that comment. Mm -hmm. Did the blue car just not fit the theory? I mean, I guess it didn't fit the theory, but also you have an alibi totally removing Randall from the area. Yeah. You definitely do. I mean, obviously, that didn't come out until later. Right. But, but I mean, now looking at it going forward, mm -hmm. and I understand that they may have had this information about this car ahead of time, but if that car was really only seen by the kids and the kids thought they were being followed, I think that if they had other criminals in the area and they knew they had these other sexual assaults in the area, they were like, okay, we need to hone in on these other sexual assaults that happened, find what evidence we have that links all of them together. Mm -hmm. And go from there because then from there we can probably get to the murder because we don't have a ton on the murder. Yeah, no, I, I totally agree with that. But this metallic blue four-door sedan mm -hmm. is now most likely the suspect's vehicle. Yes, agreed. So we were talking about the family a few minutes ago. So now at this point, they, you know, were kind of talking to the media a little bit more, I think, about this whole situation with the car. And Rosie's father had stated at one point, quote, I'm convinced that there's an excellent chance that the man in the car is the man who abducted Rosie. I'm also convinced that the man in the car was not Randy Breer, end quote. And just to add fuel to the fire of how now at this point, the family was becoming frustrated with the PD and their intense focus on Breer, David stated for another publication at some point, quote, I believe the police should either present their evidence to a grand jury or acknowledge that, in fact, there is little chance that he's the guy. They should either prove it or quit talking about it, end quote. And there's that anger that you were just talking mm -hmm. about, John. So it came out. Yes. You know, I think it was in the beginning. They were giving 
the police they wanted to be hopeful they just had this guy being convicted of all of these other crimes mm-hmm. where victims were obviously going through traumatic events now that it's just back to them and their daughter it's like listen we know it's not this guy yes there is no evidence or very little evidence that may link him to this but he's got an alibi shit or get off the pot yeah i completely agree and i think that's clearly how they were feeling and just to add to the whole situation with authorities just being super zoned in on Breer, I read this comment that I just thought was so wild and probably attributed to all of that frustration between the family and the prosecutor because we know that he wasn't thrilled with this whole situation either. Right. He doesn't want to go forward with a case that he knows he's not going to win. I- exactly. Yeah. Or there's a very, very good chance he's not going to win. Yes. So this statement said, quote, According to police sources, some in the police department have changed their theory on the case to reflect the alibi, speculating that Rosie ran away and was abducted by Breer later, end quote. And I think this is the perfect example of trying to make a suspect fit a narrative that authorities are working off of. And from what I can tell, it appeared to be largely in part due to the profile the FBI had produced. It was like they just had blinders on and this profile was the thing that they were focusing on. If the profile says that the same person that sexually assaulted these girls also killed Rosie, then it must be this guy because he confessed to those. But like we've said already, you know, profiles aren't perfectly set in stone. Mm -hmm. Someone's not going to fit. If there's 10 bullet points, they might not fit all 10. They might only fit eight. And it could be ever changing. You could get more information later that can change a certain aspect of a profile. So to just have those blinders on and be like, no, this is what we are working with. Mm -hmm. That's just, in my opinion, not the right way to go about an investigation. No, I mean, facts will never change. Facts are always facts. Mm -hmm. So to say that, you know, you had this idea and you had this whole case kind of buttoned up in this area, but now the threads are kind of coming apart and people are like, no, it's not this guy. It's not this guy. Like Mm -hmm. clearly based on his statements, based on his alibi, based on the evidence, it's not this guy. For any agency to be like, oh, well, now we believe that Rosie actually ran away. And then while she was on the run, she came across Randall Breer. Mm -hmm. And that's when he abducted her. And that's how we place him with her. And that's how we believe they connected and why we believe he's the one responsible for her murder. Yeah, exactly. Like, think about that, right? You have this guy who is a bad dude, sexually assaulted all these young girls, committed Dozens of other crimes probably is out on parole already, stolen vehicles, blah, 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 whatever. Bad dude. Think about this girl two minutes from her house on her bike. No reason to run away. Her and her friend had a blue car following her Mm -hmm. while Randall's alibi totally removes him from the area. To now come up with this idea that that blue car has nothing to do with it. Yep. And this girl was like, "Mm, I'm two minutes away from home. It's probably going to get dark in a few hours. I have no money. I have no means of doing anything. I'm just going to run away for no reason. And then randomly, I'm going to come across this freaking rapist. It's the, it's idiotic. Yeah, the, the theory just doesn't work. And I will say that it didn't seem as though the whole PD felt this way. Based on this article, it said, you know, according to sources, some in the department felt this way. But Idiots. again, Idiots in the department felt it, that way. Yeah. So like how could even if there's one person that's trying to do that, that is absolutely ridiculous. But the whole thing is like you can't just change up an entire theory to fit your narrative, even if it's one cop. It doesn't matter. But in this case, for an extended period of time, everybody seemed to be in agreement that Rosie had been abducted the night of the second. But then there was this other comment that I found reported. I think it was in another Washington Post article, but it solidified me even more that like whoever it was in the PD that was thinking that, oh, we need to like rework this theory to make this fit was just totally grasping at straws. So the comment I'm referencing stated, quote, according to sources, it is hard to fathom that an individual would be driving around in the middle of the night looking for young victims. For Breer to have abducted Rosie, the sources said, he would have had to have driven to Fairfax from Stafford in the middle of the night and spotted a young girl who was afraid of the dark wandering around when a search party could not find her, end quote. That puts it even more eloquently than I so was trying to paint the picture. to express like, that way. No, it's whoever came up with that idea. Don't care if you're part of the police department, if you're still there, if you're a retired detective, don't care. If you came up with that idea, you're a freaking idiot. <laughs> You it's are an true. Idiot. It's so dumb. You like, are totally changing the fabric of reality to try and mold it to 
your opinion to try and close, to the, close case. the case. That's what you're doing. You're trying to close the case, and that is not how investigations should be done. I can't because stand when a family shit. goes through this trauma, then they get quote unquote justice just to find out years and years down the line that the person didn't do it makes me think of Kim Simon. Exactly. And these types of detectives, which I'm sure there were plenty of them back in the day. I hope there's less now and mm. hopefully people are more grounded in reality at least. It's all about closing the case. And if you can say, oh no, this guy got charged and convicted for the crime. It had to be him. Yep. Here is your justice. Here is your closure. Yeah. But then to find out later down the road that it wasn't it, them framing their reality, these detectives framing their reality and trying to build a case against somebody that is clearly not guilty of the crime yeah. or more than likely 99% not guilty of this crime. And then just to solidify their opinion, like, oh, they got charged and convicted. Yeah. It's you just know, it's how like, can you go to sleep at night and not feel horrible that you've given this family this essentially fake closure? True Detective Season 1. Everybody needs to watch it. Honestly. It makes me think about the detective that they brought out on the boat. Ye yes. I was like, hold on, wait, which one was that on the boat? But yeah. I don't want to give any spoilers about anything. Mm -hmm. True Detective Season 1 is a masterpiece in television. And Matthew McConaughey is an impeccable actor, and you will never change my mind. <laughs> that is all. All right, so after this, there were actually two other individuals briefly mentioned in the media that were being investigated for potentially having involvement in Rosie's murder after they'd either been arrested or were wanted for questioning in relation to other sexual assaults in the area. The first person I found media coverage on was a 30-year-old man by the name of Edward Stewart who was being looked into for an alleged sexual assault of an 8-year-old girl from the Dumfries, Virginia area. So on February 16th, 1992, Edward was arrested and charged with one count of abduction with intent to defile, attempted rape, aggravated sexual assault, and forcible sodomy. The incident occurred that same month in February of 92, and it was reported that this eight-year-old girl was abducted outside of her apartment when she and her brother went outside to pick up a newspaper. From what I understand, this Edward guy had a criminal history with at least one sexual offense. Authorities did also end up searching his home for anything that may have tied him to the sexual assault he was being arrested for, as well as any other abductions or murders. The Washington Post reported the following items were seized. Quote, 10 videotapes, a stun gun, a plastic sexual aid, and a social security card. End quote. Now, the whole reason why this guy's name even came up in relation to Rosie's murder investigation was because the eight-year-old girl who was assaulted claimed that the man who attacked her had admitted to her that he'd killed another girl. The Washington Post reported the following, quote, The victim said that prior to being released from the vehicle of the accused, she was told by him not to tell anyone what had occurred or he would kill her, Detective J.A. Urban wrote in an affidavit. He added at this time that he had done this to another girl and he had to kill her as she told someone, end quote. Well, that doesn't make sense. No, that that definitely doesn't make sense. It doesn't match up. Now, I've been unable to find what type of connection, if any, this man might have had with the area where Rosie was abducted from. But authorities did state that they were going to look at him regardless. And the same Washington Post article that I just mentioned reported that the Prince William County prosecutor, Paul Ebert, stated, quote, at this point, there is nothing to link Stewart to it except the statement he made. But he's certainly somebody you would want to look at. He's going to be looked at in connection with any similar crime. He'll be looked at all up and down the East Coast, end quote. But around the same time that this Stewart guy was arrested, the prosecutor in Fairfax was like totally still not believing that Randall Breer had anything to do with Rosie's murder at this point. And then he was also asked about this case and this Edward guy. And he felt like the only reason authorities were even looking into him was because he had just randomly grabbed a child off the street, which matches what happened in Rosie's case. So I feel like the prosecutor just wasn't having it with like any of the suspects that were coming onto police's radar. Which I understand. I mean, obviously, this prosecutor wants there to be good evidence mm -hmm. that they can go forward with to prove that this person committed the crime if they truly did. Yeah. But also, I mean, I'm always a little skeptical in regards to prosecutors because we do know that some have ulterior motives or they have, you know, aspirations of other positions after being a prosecutor and they only want to take open and shut cases. Oh, I have an example. So what's your example? We talked about it in Kathy Lynn Glady's episode mm -hmm. and Drew had brought up That's that comment about. about prosecutors and how it definitely seemed like they had someone that seemed like a reasonable suspect in that case that mm -hmm. didn't have an alibi and had all these other things against him. Whereas in this case, you've got an alibi. You've got 
this guy literally confessing to everything except for that. Right. And, you know, I just think that you're right in that regard where there could be a prosecutor who just, you know, has has these other aspirations. But I don't think that seemed like the case here. This guy seemed to have his head screwed on straight and he knew what he was talking about. And it's like, why are you even naming this guy as a suspect? There's nothing to tie him mm-hmm. to this crime. Yeah. So something else that just popped into my head was another flick that uh, we recently watched. A film? Minority Report. Wild, wild movie. So story, fantastic. Execution, not so great. Yeah, some of the uh, old early 2000s sci-fi uh, I gotta say, the jetpack was scene was the, was the one <laughs> that cringe. got me. That was real cringe. But, but just to reference something there, because mm. they are, mm. for people that don't know, um, essentially there is a pre-crime Division. branch yeah, yeah, of the government, essentially, where... They have these three psychic beings that can see murders before they happen. And then that information gets put out to investigators and investigators have to try and track down these people before they commit these crimes. And essentially when they're like being audited by another branch of the government, they're like, oh, there's always going to be a problem here. And it's the human element Mm -hmm. because you may have, you know, these three psychic beings. And if it's 100% that these people always know what's going to happen and it's never wrong. But you have whoever the investigators are working it have that human element and their opinion if their wife or their brother or themselves are the person that are going to commit that crime, that now influences their decision making, Mm. even though they know that it's probably true Mm -hmm. or most likely true, Mm -hmm. whatever is being presented. That's very similar to our justice system now. If we have evidence to prove that somebody may have done something, but the powers that be don't think it's good enough to go forward. Mm -hmm. It's like, there's always that battle of the human element. It's like, well, I make the decision to go forward with this. Okay. Well, I'm the one that got all this evidence and I think it's this person. It's like the human element is always going to be a hindrance, almost a hindrance or a benefit, depending on how you look at it. Yeah, definitely. It's a good, uh, little side riff. Yeah. But anyway, Edward Stewart's case was being brought to the grand jury and he was being held in prison without bail during this time. But after this information came out that I found in some local reports, I wasn't able to find any more details on this guy or if anything came of the charges against him or if the grand jury indicted him or what. But based on information reported regarding the grand jury proceedings and the evidence against him, I truly hope that he was indicted and that a trial took place. Just the stuff that was reported was just horrible the poor girl that, you know, testified at the indictment about what happened to her. It was just heartbreaking. Mm -hmm. So I really hope that something came of this, but I just don't know for sure. Now, just a few months later, in July of 1992, a man by the name of Frank O. Berry III shot himself inside his home after officers arrived and were trying to speak with him about an attempted abduction of a nine-year-old girl behind a 7-Eleven store in Fairfax, Virginia. Thankfully, the young girl was not taken because people in the area were able to get her away from this guy. And then those individuals had taken down the license plate number of the car that was involved in the attempted abduction. And the PD was able to link the plate to this Frank Berry guy. Was it a metallic blue Ford or sedan? Unfortunately, I don't know. Okay. I wish I knew that. But authorities were said to be looking into him in connection with Rosie's murder due to the similarities of the girl's ages, the proximity regarding the location, Fairfax, Virginia, Obviously, Fairfax County is the location where Rosie was from, all of those similarities. But now that this man had taken his own life, authorities would be unable to get any answers directly from him. He seemed like a pretty good possible person of interest for authorities to have looked into. But yet again, just like with the previous situation with Edward, I couldn't find any further reporting on the matter. And I have no idea what came of the investigation into this guy. So now at this point, I think we can dive into theories. Honestly, I feel like the theory regarding Randall Breer just doesn't hold any weight. I think John and I have kind of come to that same conclusion as we've worked through this episode, but I will let John give his opinion now. Well, I am totally torn. Okay. Because we have this profile and you have to put your faith in the profile to some extent. Mm -hmm. Now, when you think about who could get away with this, who could be living in that area know the area and get away with it, you would think it's more, you know, some white collared person that has a family and they have the kids and they look great in society and nobody would ever suspect them of it. Mm -hmm. 
But when you have this profile that's, you know, painting a totally different picture from that, it's like, I don't know. This is one where I don't really know where to go with it right now because the suspects that have been put forward don't seem like they're good for it just based on not their prior actions, but based on the evidence put forward. Yeah, I agree. It's um, it's a tough one. I think that I don't I, I don't know. I don't know what to think. All right. Well, I want to go back to one other thing that you had mentioned at the very, very top of the episode when we were talking about the area where Rosie's body was found. And, you know, we kind of touched on the fact that, like, was this someone that knew the area that lived around there? And I think the situation with where she was taken from and where she was left really leads me to believe that there could have been a deeper connection between Rosie and this person, whether it was they knew each other just in passing or if the perpetrator felt as though there was a perceived relationship between the two of them, whether it be like John mentioned before, a janitor. What if it was a janitor at her school or I don't know if her family went to church. Maybe it was someone there and he had seen her. And I feel like I'm like taking my criminal minds, you know, (laughs) expertise into my head here, but they could have had this perceived connection with her and felt as though she was, you know, giving off some sort of interest in him when that's obviously not at all what would be happening with a 10 year old girl, but they have like this sick, twisted brain where they might be thinking that that's what's going on. Rationalizing it. Yeah. And then like build up the courage to actually act on that behavior. Yeah. I think that makes sense because in the profile, and again, if this profile is accurate, is said that this suspect didn't have a normal relationship with anybody or with any women around their age. Yeah. So there's no normal relationship there. So if, you know, all women around that age thought that this guy was a creep or whatever, and then maybe Rosie had one nice thing to say to him or said hi to him in passing one day, he was like, oh my God, nobody ever says hi to me and Mm -hmm. no women ever pay attention to me. And if I go up to her, she'll talk to me because maybe from her perspective, she's like, oh, I'm just going to talk to this guy or whatever. And he's like, oh, she must really like me or something. Mm -hmm. And then- attached to that like you were just saying and yeah i don't know and something else i wanted to bring up too has to do with what you were just mentioning about you know kind of living in this nice association more white collar with you know someone who seems to have their life together that doesn't necessarily mean at least in my opinion that monsters can't live in the shadows of a place like this mm-hmm. and it makes me go back to again what we were talking about earlier whether that be a maintenance worker, whether that be a landscaper, someone that took care of things within this association. I think, you know, maybe it's not someone who lived within the association, but frequented it a lot. And again, that just like coincides with all of that Mm -hmm. being, it doesn't seem like it could be a neighbor or, you know, someone that seems good from the outside, but are you looking at the right people within this area? That's kind of what like comes into my head about it. Yeah, like whoever the suspect was lived maybe, you know, 10 miles out, but they traveled here all the time because they worked here and the requirements for their job, you know, led them to all these other places. So they were kind of familiar with the area. Mm -hmm. It makes sense. I wish there was more to go on. I wish there were, you know, I wish that the suspects that were been put forward in this episode had something that I could cling to and say, okay, I think it's this person. Yeah. Well, there's actually one more theory that I can't out on me. Yeah, I came across this theory while researching this case, and it actually has to do with a girl who went missing from Lorton, Virginia, just five months after Rosie was killed. The young girl who went missing was five-year-old Melissa Brannon. Now, I don't know if this theory will hold any weight at all once we dive into the details, but Melissa's case is one that stood out to me and is a story I wanted to tell you. So we'll be back next week to cover Melissa's case. But please, regarding Rosie Gordon's case, if you know anything about who killed her in July of 1989, please contact the Fairfax County Police Department at 703-246-7511, or you can provide an anonymous tip by calling the Fairfax County Crime Solvers at 1-866-411-8477. Thank you all so much for tuning in every week. We're so happy to have you here. Make sure to leave us a five-star review before you go and follow us on our socials. 
You can follow us on Instagram at Wicked Deeds Pod and on Twitter at Wicked Deeds. Don't forget to visit our website, wickeddeedspodcast.com, to take a look at any photos from this episode and view our source material. But most importantly, tune in next week for an all-new episode.